And inshallah, we're gonna, um, you know, I'm not gonna hold you guys up. Again, for those who have children, have babysitting in the front, in the front classroom. Um, Mila, we're gonna have Mom Celine College. Gonna introduce um, our teacher, Dr. Umar Abdul Farouk, Farouk Abdullah. <coughs> inshallah, um, Mom Celine, you ready? <coughs> Just a few minutes ago, let's enjoy ourselves that evening. <laughs> so, in that spirit, inshallah ta'ala, we welcome you to the Muslim Center. And I'm going to start by actually asking Imam Adullah to extend that formal welcome. Imam. Bismillah ar Rahman Rahim. Well, as always, we at the Muslim Center, uh, we are happy to be able to exercise the reason we were formed in the first place, and that is to bring all the Muslims together. In, in brotherhood and sisterhood, and to have a place at, at, to worship the, for the worship of only Almighty God, Allah. So we welcome you here. We thank you for being here. We're thankful for our guests to be here. Uh, actually, the looking for as a guest, and we're looking at him less and less as time goes on as a guest that he uh, lives here and moves here. Mm -hmm. But uh, welcome, Brother Mar, yeah, and thank you, thank you everyone, for attending. <clears throat> so, brothers, this is the importance of knowledge one of the main messages of the Quran. From the very first verses revealed, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Quran, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has stressed the importance of knowledge. This knowledge carries with it responsibility, and according to Quran, Allah has made a world filled with signs, ayats, just like ayats in the Quran, for human beings to reflect on and to comment. Belief should not be based on blind faith or simply adhering to tradition. Rather, it should be based on knowledge, reflection, and understanding. Alhamdulillah, this afternoon, we have a program that is being co-sponsored by several different uh, institutions. One is uh, Alam, and I'll talk uh, in a few minutes a little bit more about Alam. Uh, number two is not in order of importance or significance, but just in order of, of my own <coughs> recognition. The Beacon Foundation, Alhamdulillah, who is doing some very, very excellent work here locally, Obviously, the Muslim Center, where we are presently seated, and the Muslim Enrichment Project, uh, affectionately known as MEP. Let me talk for a few minutes about Alam. Alam is an institution that upholds our tradition of critical thinking in Islam and seeks to empower Muslims with literacy. Their scholars include Dr. Jackson, <coughs> Dr. Abdullahi Jackson of the University of Michigan, Sheikh Ali Suleiman Ali, Imam Munir Farid, and Sheikh uh, Leda La Evans. They were blessed to have the winter program here at the Muslim Center two years ago, and this year they will be holding the program in Dallas, Texas over the Martin Luther King weekend. Their annual month-long summer program is held in Livonia with a number of scholars, and in the past, Dr. Moore has taught as well. And for further information, you can go to their website, which is www.alamprogram.com for more information. Now, I know you've all come this afternoon listening to Dr. Omar as well. So I'm going to take just a few seconds and give you a little background for those of you who are not uh, familiar with him or who may not uh, remember all of the things that he's been involved in uh, both here and abroad. Dr. Omar has a PhD from the University of Chicago, after which we were blessed to have him come to the University of Michigan and teach there at the University of Michigan. He has studied for 16 years with traditional scholars of the U.S. and Jeddah Saudi Arabia, while at the same time teaching religion at the Abdulaziz University there in Saudi Arabia. He has many conferences, retreats, seminars, alongside such notable scholars as Dr. Sean Jackson, Chef Hamza Yusuf, and Dr. T.J. Winter, and others alike. Dr. Omar currently teaches Maliki Law at Darul Hassan in Chicago. He also teaches the Hiyah of Imam El Ghazali twice a week in conjunction with Khalif Collection and Masjid of Quartier. So without further ado, we're going to ask our <coughs> professor, <coughs> Dr. Umar Abdullah, to address us. Okay. Bismillah. 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 
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ve sallallahu ala seyyidina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve sellem. Allah'ım iftah aleyna bi hikmetike ve nşur aleyna bi rahmetike ya zel celali vel ikram. Allahümme salli ve sellim ve barik ala seyyidina Muhammedin ve ala alihi adedeke lilahika yaliku bike malihi. Ya Ali muallimna min ilmike ma tadda bihi anna ve la t'akhizna bima ta'lamuhu minna. Ya halimu khalliqna bi khuluk hilm ve haqqiqna bi haqaiq ilm. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'alamtana inaka anta alimul hakim. Rabbi şahli sadri ve yassirli emri ve ahlul uqdata min lisani yafqahu qawli sallallahu ala seyyidina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve sallam. This is not the first time that I've been at this blessed mosque. Every time I've been here has been a great joy. It's always been in the company of the best of people. And coming here for me today is a joy. And the time that we have together is a pleasure. And I hope that in this time that we have together today, that we will all be free to do what we want to do. Um, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, At qiyā ummati abriyā min at takaluf The righteous of my nation, the nation of Islam, are free of formalities. So what we are going to talk about is a very important history lesson. And it's important that you understand it the best you possibly can. And history lessons, especially like this, they involve new information. Many of you know this already, this information. But for some of you, it will be new. And taking in new information is not always easy. So you may have questions as we go through, and feel free to ask your questions. Anything I say that's not clear, feel free to ask. Anything that you want to add, feel free to do that. We want to get as much benefit out of this historical lesson as we possibly can. Is history important? How important is history? What would you say? Malcolm. What did Malcolm say? Malcolm. What did he say? What's that? History is more qualified to reward any type of research. MashaAllah. History is more qualified to reward any type of research. In West Africa, the West Africans say, the world is old, but the future springs from the past, like a lion. <clears throat> The world is old. This world's got a lot of history. And we're going to look at some of that history today. But future springs from the past. And you carry in yourself that history. And uh, so history is very important. And that's also why when people want to destroy other people, they try to wipe out their historical memory. So they don't know anymore who they are. They don't know who they were. So historical memory is very, very important. And today what we want to talk about is tracing our roots. Uh, Muslims in America before Columbus. And we are going to look at a story which in my experience is the strongest of them all. We want to talk about Muslims in America before Columbus. There's a lot to talk about. But some of it is easy to prove and some of it's not. So it's very good to begin where it's easiest to prove. And therefore today we want to talk about a great historical journey by sea of Mansa Khan Khan Abu Bakr II. And I'll tell you more about who he was. Right now, he was a king of Mali. And of course, when we say the word Mali today, you're going to think of the country Mali. But when we talk about his Mali, we're talking about most all of West Africa. 
that included was today Mali because that was the core area of the Bambara and the Mdinka who were his main people. Although he had Wolos, he had Fulanis, he had Serir, and he had other tribes. But these were powerful kings. These were powerful kings. The brother of Mansa Khan Khan Musa is probably the one that you are most familiar with. And that was Mansa Khan Khan Musa. Mansa Khan Khan Musa, who is his little brother. And the story that we're going to tell today is taken from Mansa Khan Khan Musa. He's the one who told us that story. So uh, this is really interesting. And it is said, Mansa Khan Khan Musa told us this. He said it when he was in Cairo in his great pilgrimage that around the year 1312 of the Common Era that his brother went across the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, in a fleet of 2,400 boats. 2,400 boats. And so this is what we want to talk about. And uh, inshallah, this is a very, very important lesson, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, and inshallah, we will find in it other things as well, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. <clears throat> One of the ideas that a lot of people have is that it's not possible to cross the ocean on your own in a little boat. That we had to wait until there were big ships with big sails who knew how to get across the ocean. <clears throat> and you'll see a lot of people say that people could have only come to America by land. It was impossible that they come by sea. Okay, but Columbus came by sea. The Spanish and the Portuguese after that came by sea. Every one of us has relatives who came by sea or today air. They crossed the, that water. And so this is one of the most important things that we need to begin with is that it is not at all impossible to cross the sea. And especially if you are an African and you leave West Africa and get in the currents, you're going to come here. It will be very difficult for you not to come here. You've probably heard stories about people who get caught in currents. We have people that want to sail around the world or paddle around the world. Sometimes it takes them years to do that. And if you've heard those st stories on the radio or you've heard about them on television, you often hear that these people get caught in currents as the ocean is full of currents. And when they get caught in the current, they have to paddle all day long just to stay in place. And sometimes they don't make it. And sometimes they break. So the ocean is filled with currents. And when we look at Africa and America, we're looking at two worlds that are next to each other and are actually very close. They're very close. So here we have the African coast. And of course, this is West Africa here. These are the Cape Verde Islands. Okay, these islands right here are the Cape Verde Islands. The Cape Verde Islands are right at the north of the equatorial current. Okay, this is the equatorial current. It comes down by the coast of Africa. Then it goes this way, by the Cape Verde Islands, and it goes right to the Caribbean. And then also sometimes it goes further down by what is today Ghana, and then it comes further south, but it still comes to the Caribbean. Okay, those are the equatorial currents. They are extremely important, and they are very powerful. Every year we get hurricanes that are coming to Florida and to parts of the Caribbean, and they are also carried by the currents. The winds are also affected by currents. You get the buildup of these storms off the coast of West Africa. West Africa hardly ever has storms. And I've asked people there, I've had the honor to be there many times, that because usually the West African coast, especially in the Gambia, it's very, very peaceful. 
very calm. And I will ask people, because I'm only there at certain times of the year, do you ever have hurricanes? They don't even know what that is. I said, do you ever have big storms? Not like we have. Of course, they have rainy season. They'll have the rainy season when the, the, the monsoon rains come up and there's thunder and lightning. Very beautiful, very important. But they don't have these storms like we have. Those storms are bred there. And then they follow the equatorial current and they hit the Caribbean or Florida or the American coast. Okay, so these equatorial currents are very, very important. And if you get in the current, you're going to come to America whether you like it or not. It will be very difficult for you not to come. If you were in a raft and you don't have a sail and you don't have an oar and you get in this current, then you will be in America or you will wash up on the shores of America in about 50 days. It means also it's a fast current because there's about 5,000 miles there. It's a strong current. It's a powerful current. So this is very, very important. And when we talk about Mansa Kankan Abu Bakr II, his 2,400 boats will go directly into the equatorial current. That will go straight into the current. He will probably come out of the Gambia River. He may have come out of other rivers. The kingdom of Mali was a river empire. It was also a land empire. It was also a sea empower, empire. The kingdom of Mali was also the most wealthy kingdom in the world in its time. No one could hold a candle to it. What was the wealth of Mali? Gold. Gold. The kings of Mali controlled the gold markets. They had gold that was beyond imagination. Where did they get that gold? Where do you think they got it? Where do you think they got the gold? Sorry? And this brother here, where do you think they got it? Is there gold in Africa? Yes, there is gold in Africa. There is gold in Africa, especially in South Africa. There's a lot of gold, and in West Africa there's gold. The Golden Coast, right? So there's a lot of gold in Africa, no question about that. And that's a very interesting story. Some historians have said, though, that when we read about the gold that was in the kingdom of Mali, they must have had some other source as well because they had a lot of gold. In the kingdom of Mali, and this is really interesting, it's very important to understand that often when we think of people before our time, we think they were isolated in the world. Well, when you have as much king gold as the kingdom of Mali had, you're not isolated anymore. People will come to you, right? They will come to you. In the kingdom of Mali, they had to have small coins. They have to have small coin, pennies, nickels, things like that. In the kingdom of Mali, what did they use for small coin? Do any of you know? How would you buy an egg in the kingdom of Mali? Do you have any idea? Uh, not little specks of gold, but little specks of something else. Seashells. Seashells. And the seashells they used in the kingdom of Mali, which were money, and a lot of First Nations of this land also use seashells, okay? But in the kingdom of Mali, the little seashells they would use came from the Maldive Islands in the Indian Ocean. That, that's very important. That means that they had direct connections with the Indian Ocean, and they were able to purchase special seashells in the Maldive Island that you don't have in West Africa. And then they're able to use the seashells as coin because gold is extremely valuable. It's very hard. You'd have to have a tiny speck of gold for an egg, right? So, that, so you see, you're talking about a world empire. You're talking about an empire that has access to the world and the world has access to it. It's also very interesting that in the Americas, the First Nations, they used wampum. And 
what was the main thing? You know, wampum is a wampum belt, right? And they sew on it valuable things. And what are some of the most valuable things you sew on a wampum belt? Beads and shells. Beads and shells. Seashells. And this is another thing that when we talk about Africa and the discovery of America, one of the points that certain scholars have made is that wampum comes from the contact area. The contact area is right here. The Caribbean and this is southern Mexico. That's a contact area because when you come across in the equatorial currents, that's the most likely place where you will end up. So your contact with land will probably be in the Caribbean, possibly Barbados. Barbados is straight shot from the Gambia River, straight shot across the water. Or it might be in Jamaica, it might be in other places. Okay, But they say that wampum spreads from the contact area north meaning also that the Native American use of wampum, it may also have come from contact with Africa, and especially the empire of Mali that used seashells for money. Okay, so this is very important. And these um, equatorial currents, um, you know, they were like conveyor belts. You get on that current, you're going to have a very difficult time to get out of the current. And it will push you to America. Also, you have currents that are coming from Asia. This is called the Black Current. And that will take you across the Pacific, and it will bring you to South America. Okay, so these currents are really, really important. And uh, in the 20th century, there were scholars who believed very strongly that human beings had come to America also by sea. And uh, they wanted to show that you could do it. One of the most famous persons who did that was Thor Heyerdahl. And he built a ship called the Ra, the Ra, which he, it was a ship like the ancient Egyptian reed boats. And he tried to take the Ra from West Africa to America, but the first journey was failure. The boat became soaked with water, before he got to the Caribbean and he had to abandon it. And then he just went back to the drawing books because when he built the Egyptian boat, he didn't put in a certain mast and a certain um, rope that ties the front to the, to the back together. So he said, let's build it again and let's do that. And then he discovered that when you do that, you don't get waterlogged. And the second time he was able to make the journey. Then he built another raft called the Contiki, and he used that to come across the Pacific the same way. So that was a big thing in the 20th century. There were other people, too, who just wanted to show us that, look, it's not impossible to cross the water. So when we go into American history, um, the oldest civilization that we know about in America is the one called the Olmec Civilization. O-L-M-E-C, like you see here. Now, the Olmecs were in the contact area. They're in southern Mexico. I'll show you. And you remember where the contact area was. Um, this man, is there any doubt that he is an African? Not a doubt at all. Not only does he look like an African, but he is wearing an ancient African war helmet. And you'll see that when we look at the Mandinkas, that their war helmets are not very different from this. These are metal bands that they put on their heads so that if they get hit by a sword, it won't crush their skull. So this man is uh, definitely an African, and these are called the Olmec heads, and they are believed to be portrayals of the rulers of the Olmec civilization. How long ago were these people believed to have been in southern Mexico? 700 B.C. 700 B.C. That's almost 3,000 years ago. That's a long, long time before Columbus. 
And again, how could they possibly get here? By sea. Of course by sea. And ancient peoples, they populated the world by boats and rafts. That's the way that ancient people got around. The world was a different place in those days. You didn't have highways. You didn't have maps. And often, if you were to go on land, you've got forests, you've got mountains, you've probably got other people that are there before you who may not be friendly, right? So in the ancient world, people prefer to travel by water. And they will use rafts and different types of boats. And often they will try to stay near the coast. And they will stay in rivers and things like that. But that is the easiest way and the safest way to travel. If you're traveling like that in West Africa, you better stay close to the coast. Because if you get off the coast just a bit, you will be taken into the equatorial current and you will end up on the other side. So it is very likely, and I believe that this is the, tr the case, that Africans were coming to America by sea through the equatorial currents for a long time. Um, there have been interesting studies about the population of Africans in America in the early colonial period. Most of us believe that all the Africans who came here were brought here against their will, having been enslaved in West Africa. That process of the black gold begins in the Gambia River in 1447, St. James Island. Okay, but some people have said that in the 1500s, when the plantation system is being established in America, the plantation system, by the, well, by the way, was developed in the Crusades by the Crusaders. The Crusaders learned about sugar from us. They learned also about other things from us. But the sugar plantation, this was a Crusader development. The first slaves, they say that slavery followed sugar like a parasite. Because sugar reduction in the pre-modern world You've either got to pay people a lot of money or you've got to have forced labor because sugar production requires a lot of work in two weeks. Getting the sugar planted, taking care of it, that's not so difficult. But when the sugar has got to be cut, you've got to cut it all as fast as you can and you've got to boil it down while the sugar content is high. And that's the reason why they say that Slavery follows sugar like a parasite. Wherever sugar went, you've got to have slaves. Unless you want to pay them a lot of money. But usually the people who are growing the sugar, they want to make as much money as they can. And sugar was the big money crop. Sugar was the crop. More valuable than oil in the world today. So that's very interesting because when the Europeans discover how to get across the ocean, the first thing they do is set up the sugar plantations. They did not develop the sugar plantations here. They had them already developed. A whole culture of bookkeeping and everything connected to the sugar plantation. But they got to have labor. They've got to have strong labor. And uh, they've got to have slavery. They tried to enslave the First Nations. And that didn't work very well. And then they go to black gold. People that are very strong very powerful, people who already know how to grow these crops they're growing anyway. That's a big story. That's a story that you know. That's a history that you carry in yourself. It's a very important part of human history. But what a lot of historians are, are saying, if we look at the black population in the Caribbean, and the Caribbean is mostly black. Have you been to Barbados? Barbados is 99% African. Have you been to Guyana? Guyana is pretty much like that too, except it has a lot of Indians who were brought there for sugar in the 1850s. So what some people are saying is that there were too many blacks in America in the 15th century for them all to have come here by slavery. Especially because the old slave boat, they didn't bring the same number of slaves. 
Today we have picture of these capitalist slave boats with hundreds and hundreds of slaves lying down next to each other and enchained. Okay? In the beginning, that's not so common. In the beginning, most of the slave boats are going to be 15 people or 20 people or 30. And usually they're going to be young people. But as the money develops and the capitalist dimension of slavery develops and they have to have this labor, then they will develop these kind of ships. Okay, so that's, a, that's an aspect of it. But when Kunti Kinti was brought to America, and that's a true story, and I know the village of Kunti Kinti, and I've been there, I know his people, they tell the story a little bit different than Alex Haley told it. And Alex Haley has his roots. May Allah have mercy upon him. I had the honor to meet him before he died. He was a Mandinka, no question about that. But the, the story that the West Africans tell about Kunti Kinti is a little bit different. It's a little bit different. But when the ship he came over in, there weren't that many slaves. There going to be maybe two dozen or something like that. In any way, this is very significant. This is an African. There is no question about that. And this African could certainly be king. If he told me, I'm your king, I don't think I would say anything. You know, it's like, you better listen to what I say. You better obey. Then look at the other old men's heads. I wish I had a better picture for you. Okay? These are the 17 known Olmec heads. They're really interesting. Do you see any of those who look like European? Do you see any of those who look like a Native American? Or Chinese? Or Japanese? Or Phoenician? Those are Africans. Those are Africans. And they are very interesting people. And again, this is 700 years before Jesus Christ. And, they, these, and this, this is another interesting thing about you know, American civilization, ancient American civilization, is the people here love to make images of their rulers. And they had religious re reasons for that. They had other reasons for that. But the thing is, is that one of the most interesting and blessed gifts is that they like to portray the people similar to the way they looked. This is a person that you would be able to identify him if, he, if you saw him on the street. Right? This is not a symbolic representation. Okay? And if you look at the rest of the old Mac heads, I hope you can see them. Like, these are individuals. And some of them are laughing. You can see that some of them probably like to joke. West Africans love to joke. And West Africans preserve the peace by joking. In West Africa, I have a friend whose name is, guess it, Kunta Kinte. I stayed with him for a long time. He's the one who took me to the village of Kunta Kinte. He didn't know about roots, but he knows about Kunta Kinte. He and I are very, very close. He's a Mandinka. He's a Mandinka. And you know, you have in the Gambia many different tribes, beautiful tribes. But the Mandinkas are very powerful. Mandink and, and I see Mandinkas here in front of me, by the way. I also see Fulanis and other. I'm going to tell you anything about that. You have to come to West Africa. They'll tell you what your marks are. I can't say that. I'm not allowed to say that. You know, but um, Mandinkas are strong people. Abelah Evans is Mandinka. He's a Jahanke Mandinka. I've been to their villages. And he, you know, he's amazing. And when I see the intelligence he's got, the strength he's got, I'm not surprised. I've been to your people. I've seen your people. You know, you are serious about Islam, and they are serious about Islam. Right? So the Mandinkas are, and the Mandinkas never defeated. But when the British came, the Mandinkas just said, just leave us in our villages and don't touch us. Okay, if you want to fight, we will fight. But, you know, we don't have guns like you have. We don't have cannons like you have. And, you know, we can't protect our women, we can't protect our children, and, but their villages stay intact. And they have solidarity. And there are other, all tribes are like that. But then you have also the Fulbe, Fulani. Fulani and Bendinga, you know, are very compatible. And they're very also easy to rival each other. So therefore, the custom is that Fulanis and Bendingas joke with each other. I had a really close friend who died last year, Allah have mercy on him. His name was Hajjalo. He's a Fulani. Jalo is a Fulani name. 
and I loved him. He loved me. I loved Kunta Kinte. He would come to see us, and Kunta Kinte would joke with him and make fun of him. Make fun of his name Jalo, because Jalo in Andinka means griot, singer. Tells you the history. That's okay. But Jalo in Fulani means something else. Of course, Haji Jalo will come back to Kunta Kinte. But I didn't like that. It's like, it's not polite. And then one night we went to the airport. I and Kunta Kinte, we wanted to pick up some people. A brother who's coming from Canada, Sam, who's probably here. Is Sam here? There he is, right there. We have to go to pick him up at the airport. And uh, as we're going to the airport, we go by Fulani women who are selling bananas. So Kunta Kinte walks by them. They know he's a Mandinka. They can see his tribal marks. He knows they're Fulanis. And he says, you won't sell any bananas tonight. And then the Fulani woman said, you'll be the first to buy my bananas. And so I said, okay, I got to check this out. <laughs> I want to find out what's going on here. And then I asked certain people, and they say, this is the way the Fulani and the Mendinkas are, because their elders do not want them to fight. And they are people who are very capable of that. And that would not be good. So therefore, they joke. And in African-American culture, you have things like that to this day. When you go to West Africa, you go home. You go home. There, those are your people there. Those are your people there. And uh, they are beautiful people. Serer and um, Jalo and Jola, they do the same thing. Serer and Jola, they always joke because they are competitors. So they're not supposed, it's, if they fight, it's outrageous. Their elders don't want them ever to fight. But they joke, you know, so that they take the pressure off. In any case, uh, you see that some of these people were very capable of joking. Look at some of them, you know. Look at this guy right here. This one doesn't look like a joke. <laughs> look at this one right here. Huh? But you see, they're all very individual. These are real people. These are real people. And you can count on it. These were the kings of the Olmec Empire. And probably, as was the case with Mansa Khan Khan Abu Bakr, they didn't bring women. That's probably the case. And so they will marry the women who were here, and therefore they will blend into the population. That's probably also what happens with the people of Mansa, Kankan Abu Bakr. Okay, um, okay, this is a contact area. So the Olmec heads, they were found here. This is southern Mexico. This is the Yucatan Peninsula. This is the Caribbean is right off the ocean. Okay, so, and this is where the Olmecs were. They get into the equatorial current. This is where they will come. It would be difficult for them to go anywhere else. And this is where they built their civilization. And out of this later on will come the Mayan civilization and others. So this is very, very important. Um, let's take a look here now at a little bit about the kingdom of Mali under Mansa Khan Khan Abu Bakr II. His rule was between 1307 to 1312. Um, the kingdom of Mali was the yellow. And it was a very tight, well-controlled empire. Again, it was a, a river kingdom. And the, the, the Malians, the people of that empire, uh, they controlled the rivers. And they policed the rivers. And they had what are called power canoes. They used power canoes to do that. Um, and they uh, had tremendous wealth. They also traded over land. They had gold. They would send caravans across the Sahara. Caravans would come back. Um, they built mosques like this in Gao. And in fact, one of the kings of Mali went to pilgrimage, and he brought back after pilgrimage Spanish Muslim architects, Andalusian architects, who were really good builders. And he asked them, he said, I want you to build me some mosques. But he said, I don't want Andalusian mosques. I don't want Spanish mosques. This is not Spain. I want African mosques. I want mosques that fit in here. And so they developed this kind of architecture which had been there before 
and uh, is one of the great beauties of West Africa. Okay, do you have any questions up to this point? So then let's look at the account. Um, this account is an account that uh, is written in Arabic. Um, this is actually the manuscript that it's written in. It hasn't been published. And it is by a great historian whose name is Shihabuddin al-Umari. Shihabuddin al-Umari. And he got information from Mansa Khan Khan Musa after the pilgrimage of Mansa Khan Khan Musa. Mansa Khan Khan Musa, the brother of Abu Bakr, was a man known for his piety. He loved Islam. And his soldiers were also great soldiers. Do you know what kind of clothes the soldiers of Mansa Khan Khan Musa wore? Does anybody want to guess? Come in West Africa. What do you think they wore? What kind of clothes did they wear? They had lots of money. Would you want to take a guess? Anybody want to take a guess? Huh? Persian brocade. Persian brocade. Where did they get it from? Persia. Where do you think they got it from? <laughs> yeah. They, 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 and to this day, I mean, one of the things about West Africa, West Africans, the Gambians are the ones I know the best. They're very clean people. Very clean people. And they love to dress. Dress is very important for them. They dress beautifully. They dress beautifully. Uh, once uh, I went to a Jola village, and the Jola are extremely honest people. Quentin Tay told me, he said, if you drop your wallet in this village, a Jola village, you can come back next week and pick it up. It'll still be there. Nobody will touch it. They won't do that. Jola are like that. They're very honest. I went to a Jola village. It was very beautiful. And, but they're poor. And uh, they sacrificed a goat for me. And they also brought me fresh cow's milk. Okay. Should have paid more attention to this so it doesn't do anything fun. But uh, they, and the cow's milk is really good. Raw milk, but clean. Good for your health. And um, because I was a white, they knew that I probably eat with silverware. So uh, they bought me the silverware in a beautiful basin of clean water. So that I take it out of the water. Why? So that I know that this is clean silverware. It, that's really beautiful. Really beautiful. So you can imagine what the, sh the soldiers of Mansa Khan Khan Musa looked like. They wore Persian brocade. And on their spearheads, they had a spe special alloy of gold, silver, and bronze. So because gold is usually soft. So they mix it with silver and bronze, and then they have gold spearhead. And of course, they can also melt it down and get gold. So it's a way of carrying gold with them as well. And when Mansa Khan Khan Musa came to Cairo on his way to Mecca, he caused inflation for 15 years. <laughs> he had so much gold. And he was also generous with his gold. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a very good question. Thank you very much. So, at the time of the Empire of Mali, Muslims around the world have been broken up into little principalities. Okay, there is no big state anymore. Uh, the Muslims in Spain and Portugal are divided into little kingdoms, which unfortunately fought against each other. And... Uh, the Muslims of North Africa and elsewhere are also little kingdoms fighting together. It's an important period of our history. At that time, you have uh, other people who are developing political power, such as, for example, the Ottoman Turks. But they're just beginning. They're just getting started. Okay, so that's the time of Mansa Khan Khan Musa. So there is no caliphate. There, and he is completely independent. He is totally independent, and again, they are so wealthy that they're very well known, and people want to go there to see them. So let's see what this says. Um, Mansa Khan Khan Musa 
told Al-Umari, our king, Abu Bakr II, his brother, did not believe that it was impossible to reach the furthest limit of the ocean sea. Okay, my brother did not believe that it was impossible to cross the Atlantic. Why didn't he believe that? That's a very good question. And uh, also, when Abu Bakr did not believe that it was impossible to cross the Atlantic, do you think that was his personal secret? No. This is one of the things that I learned in the Gambia, that everything he do did was done in public. Everything that he did was done with counsel. Everything he did, he took the opinion of other people. So, unlike Columbus, who will basically do his journey on his own and think it out and try to get some people to give him money, this is a work of the state. And Mansa Kankam Abu Bakr is talking with his brother Musa, and he's talking with others. Okay, and it's like, I know we can cross the water. That's what he believed. Okay, so how do you know that? And like, is that something that you've known for a long time? For example... The Olmecs who look a lot like you, did you learn from them? How long? This is very important. We have to study these things. Okay, so he said that our king did not believe it was impossible to go across the ocean. He wanted to do that. He wanted to attain the sea's most distant limit and fell in love with the idea. He prepared 200 ships and filled them with men warriors. An equal number of ships he filled with gold, water, and provisions, enough to last them for years. Okay, now what's he going to do? These are power canoes. They're big. And he is going to outrig them. Do you know what an outrigger is? An outrigger? It's a really big thing. An outrigger is when you take a canoe or a boat, and then you lash it to another canoe just like it. So you've got two canoes. It's like two pontoons. They do that, they, they do that also in the Gambia River. For example, if uh, they're going to cross the river, there are parts of the river is 19 miles across in places. And uh, you have also dangerous animals in the river, the most dangerous being the hippopotamus. More dangerous than a crocodile by far. Hippopotamus, and the hippopotamus is also territorial. So the hippopotamus will attack your boat. And if your boat is outrigged, then it's hard for him to turn it over. If you've got a canoe, you're in the water. But if you've got that canoe outrigged, latched to another canoe, then it's difficult for him to do that. He can throw it up and it will come down, but it's hard for him to turn it over. And often they will have one of the boats will have the women and the other will have the men. And they can cross the river like that safely. So this is probably what he's doing here. He's got it outrigged. One of the canoes will have warriors in it. Okay, and they can use sails, but they also use paddles. And that's very important because to get to America is not difficult. They just get into the equatorial current. You don't even have to paddle. If you paddle, you go faster. They don't even have to use a sail. If you use a sail, you'll go faster. And the winds are going to usually blow that way. How are you going to get home? Very important. That's when you need to have power canoes. And you have to go north of the current. And then you can get your way home. You can paddle home. That's very important. So he prepared 400 ships for this purpose. And one ship will be warriors. The other one will be gold, salt, water, and provision. And one of the things that is done in West Africa, especially on the shore, the north shore of the Gambia River, also the south shore, is dried meat. They are masters at drying meat. And people say they've been doing that for a long, long time. Again, dried meat is what you need. Then you can take that and you can have it for a long time. Salted meat, smoked meat, dried meat. So they're going to also have that. He said to the travelers on them, do not come back until you have reached the furthest limit of the sea or your provisions and water have run out. They left and gone for a long time. Like you have to cross the water. Then you come back and tell me. Okay, then King Abu Bakr. Okay, so, uh, and anyway, I shortened the story. 
The story says that one of the boats came back. It didn't cross the Atlantic. And then Abu Bakr asked them, why did you come back? And they say, we lost the group. And the way they describe it indicates that the group got into the current before we did. He said they got into the river in the sea. That's what they call it. That's the current. The currents are like that. And they disappeared over the horizons, and we couldn't catch up. So we came back. And so he said, okay. He said, then King Abu Bakr II prepared 2,000 more boots. 1,000 for himself and the men he would take with him, and 1,000 for provisions and water. And he set out on the ocean sea with those who were with him and sailed on it. That was the last we saw of Abu Bakr and his men. Now why, does this make sense? Why would Abu Bakr do that? He is the king of Mali. He is very powerful. Why would he do this? Very, very good question. At Taghiberdi, who is another historian, I haven't seen this account, but a Moroccan brother told me he read it. He said he read the same account in Taghiberdi, and Taghiberdi said that Musa, Kansa Kan Musa, said that we would bring gold from the other side of the sea. And I think that that is the secret. Because Africa has lots of gold, it's true does have lots of gold, but America has lots of gold. And when the Spanish come here, what are they looking for? El Dorado, the land of gold. Where is El Dorado, by the way? Guyana. Guyana, which is a virgin land today. Guyana is a beautiful country. South America, off the coast of Trinidad. Almost all the people live on the coastline. They are 12% Muslim. They are 12% Muslim, but when you go into the forest, you know, that, that's, there's jaguars there. There are other things there, but uh, and that's probably where the gold was. And there are other places too. There are a lot of competitors for El Dorado. But uh, some Muslim historians, they believe that Muslims were coming here getting gold. And they believe that the West Africans did it, and they believe other people did too, like the Andalusians as well. And they did other things. They got other things. Maybe we can talk about that more if it's interesting for you. But he's got to have a motive. You're not the, imp the king of a great empire who's got everything that money can buy, and you're going to get, you're going to send 4,000, you're going to send uh, 2,400 boats across the Atlantic and go yourself? And your brother agrees that you go. And again, he didn't do this. This wasn't like he was a crazy man. This was state decision. These were the kings and the princes of Mali. And they consulted the seers. They consulted the African seers. And you have them to this day. And they consulted the sheikhs as well. That what is your opinion about this? Is this wise to do? Is it beneficial to do? So this is very interesting. So he said at the end of this, that was the last that we saw of Abu Bakr and his men. Okay, well, take another look. Take another look. These are clay statues from ancient America. We call them technically, technically terracotta, terracottas, burned clay. These are figurines, statuettes that were made in old ancient Mexico around 1300 and let's say 20. Around that period, the same exact period that the fleet was sent out. Okay, and this man here, you can tell what he is. First of all, he's wearing compound earrings. And compound earrings were worn by the Mandinka and the Bamba and probably other tribes as well. He's wearing, so he's got compound earrings. He's also got a Mandinka helmet. He's also got other marks, and when I showed this to some of my beloved brothers in the Gambia, they said, Donso, Donso, he's a hunter. This is a hunter. Okay, now what does that mean? What does that mean? The hunter, Donso, is a special person. Because not just that he's a hunter, but that he has gifts, like some hunters have. That the Donso can take you into the jungle and bring you out alive. 
the dog so knows where the snakes are and what kind of snakes they are. This brother's a hunter. I know that. And he, he can tell you about this. You have a sense that Don So also knows, should you go by land or should you go by sea? The Don So also knows where the lion is and where the leopard is and where the baboons are. He knows that. So the Don So is very important. And this statuette shows that this Mandinka Don So, he was probably one of the leaders. We don't know his name. But he was probably one of the leaders. And you can go to villages this day in Senegal and the Gambia and in Mali where Donsos can produce this same kind of dress. They do that at certain, they have certain festivals where they will do that. But this is really important. And who is this beautiful man right here? Do you doubt that he's a Muslim? Do you doubt he's got a turban on? That's a bambara. That's a bambara. If you ever saw a bambara, that's a bambara. I showed a picture to this wonderful woman who knows the tribal marks of Africans. I showed her a picture of Noble Drew Ali. Some of you know who Noble Drew Ali was. May Allah have mercy on him. Moorish Science Temple. He, she said, Bambara. That's the first thing she said. Bambara. That's a Bambara. Okay, this man's also a Bambara. And Bambaras are strong people. Bambaras are very strong people. And this would be the core population that was probably in those boats. Okay, so we didn't see, we, we see those faces today. And these were works of art that were produced in ancient Mexico a long time before Columbus was born or his grandfather was born. Okay, so these are almost certainly uh, people that were on the voyage. We, we, can, we, we can guess that. That's not absurd to guess that. Okay, and um, inshallah, it's really, it's a great, I believe, blessing that Allah has preserved for us these terracottas. They were found in the National Museum of Mexico, in a basement, in a box. And I can tell you the person that found them. And you have a lot of statues like that. Here's another one. Um, Again, this man also looks like he's from Mali. He looks like a Malian. If you go to Mali, you will see a lot of people that look like that. He might also be one of these people. He might be one of their children. You know, but this is another one of those mini terracottas. And he's got his hat on as well. So, and there are a lot of these. Not just three or five. There are a lot of them. So this is a very, very important thing to study. Um, how are we doing for time? We're okay? Yeah. So um, now let's just close. Bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. All of you have heard of Cortez. And you've heard also of Pizarro. Pizarro, as they say in Spain. The conquistadores, the conquerors who conquer the Americas. That's an interesting thing to talk about. Uh, Cortez conquered Mexico City, Tenochtitlan, Tenochtitlan. That's like 15, 19, 15, 21. Here's what he writes. First of all, when Cortez came to the Yucatan Peninsula, which is the contact area of the Olmecs that we looked at before, he gave it a name. Didn't have a name he knew before that, and he called it Cairo. But why would you do a thing like that? Why would you call this Cairo? And they say, well, because he thought that he had discovered part of the Islamic world. Uh, what? Why would you, Cortez, who knows so much about Muslims and the way they look, think that you were in the Muslim world? Now, you people really don't have a very good, you don't have a GPS. Okay, now he called it Cairo. Well, as you know, there are pyramids down there. They're Maya pyramids, but he almost certainly didn't see a single pyramid because they were in the jungle overgrown. So he saw something else that made him think that this must be a Muslim land. All of those Spanish, when they came here, Columbus included, they always had an Arab, Arab translator on board so that they could try to use Arabic as the language of communication. Then when... Cortez conquers Tenochtitlan, Mexico City. 
He says in his book, in this great city there are many mosques. In this great city there are many mosques. Houses of idols and many beautiful buildings. Of course he didn't know what he was talking about. Right? Uh, and this is what our historians say, because all of our historians have read these passages. Pizarro would say the same thing, that wherever he goes, even in Peru, he found Muslims. In Venezuela, they found Muslims. The Spanish in New Mexico, in the 1700s, wrote that the Apache Indians were doing jihad, and that they had mosques in their camps. Well, you know that can't be true. What was wrong with these people? What was wrong with these people? It's like they've got Muslims on the brain, right? Um, but this, this is one of the interesting things about America, is that when the Europeans came here, history was basically wiped out. And one of the main reasons, as you probably know, was because of disease, that diseases began to spread, that the native populations here uh, didn't have immunity to, and also they didn't know how to make medicines for. If they, because they were good at making medicines, but diseases like smallpox and other things like that, um, they just it wiped them out. That was everywhere the case, in North America, South America, Central America, and then other things happened as well. The conquistadores were not friendly people. They were not politically correct at all. And uh, they wiped out their enemies. So the thing is, is that when we talk about North America, Central America, South America, and the Caribbean, before Columbus, um, you know, we don't know a whole lot about what was happening there because usually the slate was wiped clean. And that's why we have to take these stories very seriously. Cortez is not a fool. Cortez was trained in the arts of war. Cortez was a strategist. He might not have been very nice, but to think that he couldn't tell the difference between a mosque? You don't think he ever saw a mosque? How many mosques did he burn down? How many, how many mosques did he see? So when he said that in this great city there are many mosques, why can't we believe that? And it's again cognitive frames, the way we think. You know that you can't cross the ocean in a canoe. You cannot cross the ocean in a sailboat. It's impossible. And therefore, nobody came to America by sea. So that's why if we want to tell this story, the first thing we've got to do is show you that you can come by sea, and in fact, that it happened. And in fact, it may have happened most of the time without people intending to do it, but then in the case of Mansa Khan and Abu Bakr II, he wanted to do it. And as the emperor of Mali, uh, the motive is very likely gold. It's very likely gold because they control the world gold market. They controlled it. Uh, we had a beautiful conference in Spain in 2009 that was about the Moriscos. How many of you know what a Morisco is? Sister, what is a Morisco? After the Inquisition? Yeah, and that's what Morisco is. So, um, before the fall of Granada, there were millions of Muslims everywhere in Spain and Portugal. Millions. Millions. They were the majority population in many places. They were the heads of a great civilization. Okay, as the uh, Crusades conquer northern Spain and middle Spain and southern Spain, they're very careful not to touch the Muslims because if they do that, it's going to be very hard to fight. So every time they conquer a Muslim population, they will basically say that you, know, you were good to us. 
You know, everywhere that the Muslims ruled the Christians in Spain and Portugal, they had bishops that went to Rome, they had nuns and priests, they had the whole ten yards. Okay, they had everything. So if you were good to us, we'll be good to you too. You can still be Muslims, you can dress, you can sacrifice your animals, you can teach your children, but do not aid and abet the Muslims who are fighting us. Put down your weapons. If you do that, there will be trouble. That's the policy they fall, followed. Okay, so then when Granada falls, you've got millions of Muslims everywhere in Spain and Portugal. You've got them even up in the Pyrenees Mountains, everywhere. And they're very important in the economy. And then after the fall of Granada, then the decision is taken that we are strong enough now. All you people are going to become Christians. All Jews will become Christians. All Muslims will become Christians. All Christians will be Roman Catholic. No Nestorians, no Jacobites, nothing else. Okay, and then they are forcibly converted. Okay, once they are forcibly converted, then they are watched by the Spanish Inquisition. Okay, and that, the last Muslim who was burned at the stake in Spain was in 1837. 1837. But they had to hold on in secret. They had to hold on in secret. And Morisco is the name that was given to people like that. But then again, history is very important. You have to wipe out the historical memory. So in the 1600s, the Spanish banished from Spain all Moriscos. Banished. That's a sad story. There are a lot of sad stories in history. There are a lot of tears in history. There's a lot you know, of injustice in history. And they banished about two million. Was that everybody? Never. Never. But after the banishment of these roughly two million Moriscos, there are no more Moriscos in Spain and Portugal, right? So you're a Morisco, but you won't dare say that now. You know that, but if you tell that to anybody, you're up in front of the Inquisition, and you will be put to death, and your family will be ruined. Okay, because you have lots of Moriscos left. Okay, but it's like you forget about that. You will never remember that. You will never remember your ancestry. And, you know, you just one of us. You're one of the crusaders who conquered this land. And don't tell anybody about your background. Don't tell anybody about your history. When I was in Spain uh, the first time, you know, I mean, you would see people there that you know that this is a Syrian. This is a Yemeni. This is an Egyptian. Uh, this brother named Mahia Molina. Molino is a very common Mexican name. Molino is a very common Morisco name. So he became a Muslim. His brother Abd Khabir became Muslim. His other brother became Muslim. All three of them became Muslim. They took me to see their grandmother. Well, she was an Egyptian. She was so Egyptian you expect her to say Isaiah. <laughs> and Naharba. Right? She was 100% Egyptian. And so I asked her in Spanish, do you know your ancestry? What do you think she did? She looked at me like, you don't have any manners at all? And she left the room, and she didn't come back. She didn't come back. She looked at me like, I thought you were my friend. I thought you were my friend. And she left the room. And Yahya said, let me tell you what you just did. He said, let me tell you. He said, I just, you know, I want to tell you what happened just now. Because he said, we were brought up that if you tell anyone, if anyone asks you your ancestry, you don't say a thing. Because if you tell them your ancestry, you're up in front of the Inquisition. You will be destroyed. So the only person who will ask you your ancestry is your enemy. That's very interesting. A lot of Mexicans have that too. I have met Mexicans who say, I told them the story of the Molinos, and they say, that's the same way in my family. You don't talk about your ancestry. So uh, history is a really interesting thing. And people who have great history, and you all have great history. And as the West Africans say, the world is old, but the future springs from the past. 
You've got that in your blood. And this is one of the wisdoms of Allah in the trials and tribulations of the past. Now, is that, inshallah, the line will spring into the present. Yes, brother. Walaikum <coughs> salam. Very, very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, my own family was very close to the Iroquois nation. Very close. So like I have feelings about things like this. And a lot of African Americans are Cherokee. My wife is very much Cherokee. She's also African American. But she's very Cherokee. And the Cherokee and the Iroquois are the same people. They speak the same language. Just Cherokees were in the south, the Iroquois were in the north. And um, these are interesting people. Very interesting people. Sequoia was one of the great chiefs of these Cherokee nation. Have you ever seen a picture of Sequoia not wearing one of these? He always wears a turban. He always, why? And who taught you to tie that turban so well? And uh, there is a brother uh, um, who is of Cherokee background, whom I know his name is Abdul Haq. His mother belongs to the Wolf Clan. The Wolf Clan are shamanists meaning they are the seers. And he told me, he said, my mother's clan has told me that we were Muslims, but we kept it hidden from the white man. We did not let that be known. When they wanted to know about Cherokee religion, then we told them about old Cherokee religion. Is that true? Is that exaggerated? I can't say, and we have to be really careful to study these things well. In the history of the Iroquois nation, you have the story of Ganawida. Ganawida was a Huron. The Huron also belongs to that same people. They're very powerful people. They're very dangerous people. They're very good fighters and they're very good at strategy. The Hurons are very difficult to control. But De Ganawida was a Huron. And he believed in the oneness of God. But he was chased. He had to leave the Hurons. They didn't accept him. And so he went to what is today New York State. And there he encountered Hiawatha. Hiawatha was a Mohawk. And Mohawks are the, do the dominant tribe of the Iroquois nation. You have Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, and others. And Hiawatha was a cannibal. And Hiawatha uh, had long hair, and he put snakes in his hair. There he had snakes. But if you go to talk to Hiawatha, he, it's hard to look at Hiawatha. He's not pretty to look at. He's big and he's very dangerous. And he eats his enemies a lot. He, he's a cannibal. And the snakes will come out and look at you. It's like, oh, wow. <laughs> like, uh, you know, Mohawk actually means human eater. Eater of humans. So they say that Deganawida came to Hiawatha. And he put himself in a tree over the lake where Hiawatha would wash. And Hiawatha, Hiawatha is ugly, frightening. And so Hiawatha comes out in the morning to wash, and he sees a beautiful face, smiling. It's Deganawida. And Hiawatha goes like... And then Deganawida jumps down from the tree, and he laughs at him. And he says, like, that was a beautiful face you saw, wasn't it? <laughs> he said, that's your face. That's not my face. He says, you are a beautiful man. But you must declare the oneness of God. You must follow the law of God. You must give up cannibalism. And you must unify the nation. The Seneca, the Cayuga, the Andaga. That's what Iroquois means. It means confederacy. Okay, so you, Mohawks can do that. Other people can do that. So you've got to put them together. And Hiawatha does those things. And then Hiawatha becomes very beautiful. And he becomes very wise. And he puts together the Iroquois nation. Those are interesting stories. Those are very interesting stories. And um, so if we look at the story that we just had, 
that Cortez comes into Mexico City and says this is a great city and has many mosques. And like those African Muslims came over in the 1300s. Okay, you can expect that Islam would have traveled. You can expect that it might have entered tribes like the Cherokee and like the Iroquois and the Lakota and the Comanche and the Apache. These tribes in particular are the ones who have that aspect about them. And uh, so that's very possible. Again, we have to be careful not to exaggerate and not to get carried away. We have to be really sober and we have to understate and we have to look for the evidence. But we have to understand that what we're talking about here is um, a precious treasure. It has to be uncovered properly. Yes, brother. Wa alaikum assalam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are stories like that. The brothers asking other stories of people going back home. Of course, uh, here in the United States, uh, you have the story of Ayub ibn Sulaiman. He was a Fulani, and he was a great scholar, and he is able to go home. And then you also have Prince among slaves, Ibrahima. So Ibrahim is also able to go home. I believe that he was able to take his wife. He was not able to take his children. So you do have people that went back home. Um, about that, I don't know. But I expect so. Because if indeed Africans were coming here for gold, they're definitely, want to go, want, they're definitely going to want to go home. And they can do that too. Uh, why then don't we have any knowledge about that? Well, why would you think? Why would you think? Uh, we live in a world that shares a lot of information. Although, as you probably know, people that have really private information don't share it with anybody. And they also are very careful to guard themselves against espionage. Right? And in the ancient world, Maps are not something that you go to Barnes and Noble to buy. They don't sell maps. You've got a map and you keep it secret because this is your guide to the markets of the world. So you don't expect the King Mali to say, we discover gold in America. Put it in the headlines of the newspapers. No, they will say top secret. Keep it quiet. This is one of the reasons also why we don't know a whole lot about the gold mines of West Africa. Um, the story that I have read in history is that the kings of Mali did not know where the gold mines were. How could that be? Does that make any sense to you? And that's because the gold mines were controlled by special tribes. And those tribes their whole religion and culture was based around keeping the mines hidden and secret. Then how did the kings of Mali get gold? How did anybody get gold? I'll get to it in one second. How did they do that? What you do is you have a rendezvous point, a meeting point, which is designated. It might be a river, for example. Okay, so you go to that place and you put there the thing you want to sell. The thing that they really want you to bring is rock salt. Because they live in the forest. And they have problems with iodine and salt. So rock salt is worth more than gold. And in the pre-modern world, salt was worth more than gold. Salt is very important. We've just got so much of it today that we eat too much of it. So you say you have rock salt. So you take some stacks of rock salt, you leave it there, and you go away. And you better go far away. And then at night time, they will come and look at what you left. And if they want it, they will put gold there. Okay, then the next day, you come back, and you look at your rock salt, and you look at the gold. And you say, like, that's not a good deal. Okay, or you say, that's a really good deal, take the gold and go, and leave the rock salt. Okay, because they say, oh, we're willing to pay that. If you say, like, I don't accept that, 
my, my salt's worth more gold than that. Then what do you do? Just leave the salt. And then you go away and they will come back at night and they may give you more gold or they may take the gold away. And that way you know that they're not going to bid any higher. That's the way they did it. One of the kings of Mali, we are told, he, it's like, I'm the king of Mali. Like, what's going on? So he said, capture some of those people. Cap them. And he did that. And then they say that he tried everything he could do to get them to tell where the mines were. They wouldn't do it. And in the end, he even tortured them. And they wouldn't do it. And in the end, he even killed them. And so there was no gold until he died. As soon as he did that, those people would not give any gold anymore until he died, and then peace was made. So this is the important thing, is that in the old world, people kept secrets. And if you knew how to get to markets by sea or land, or you knew where the gold mines were, you didn't publish that in books. That was top secret. So they kept these things secret. And therefore, you can imagine that they would go and come and not tell anybody. This is what the Arabs were doing in pre-Islamic history. In pre-Islamic history, the Arabs learned the secret of the trade winds, the monsoon winds. So they would go from southern Yemen to East Africa. And in East Africa, they would get treasures. And then when the winds blow north, they will come back. And they will also take the same winds to India where they get treasures. And when the winds come back, they will come back to Arabia. And then they send this wealth overland through caravans. And those caravans made lots of money. They were very wealthy. But the Greeks and the Romans and others, they never knew the secret because it was kept so well. And for that reason, they would call Arabia Happy Arabia. You know, because it's got all this stuff there. If we could only get into Arabia, the problem is desert. And also the people who live in desert. <laughs> not going to let you come. Okay? But they say, if we could only get there, we would have gold and silver and frankincense and myrrh. Most of that stuff's not there. They're getting it by sea, but they won't tell you. That's a secret. And, you know, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Majalisu bil amana he said that whenever we sit with each other, not like this, this is a public lecture, but you know, when your friend sits with you to tell you a secret, or your sister sits with you to tell you her problems, you cannot tell other people that. And one of the sunnahs of the Prophet is learning, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, to keep secrets, not in order to manipulate people, not in order to trick people, but in order to protect ourselves. The Prophet said, take, seek help in fulfilling your need by secrecy. If you have a big business idea that you want to do, you're going to keep secret. You will only share that with certain people whom you trust, whom you expect to help you and to work with you. Right? And a lot of us today, we don't know that anymore. We talk about everything. Uh, the Israelis used to say that you don't have to be much to be an Israeli spy. They say all you've got to do is be able to pay the cab fare. Because you go to most of the Arab countries around them and you can get people to talk. Oh, so and so is an officer in the army and he told, you know what he told me? And do you know about the weapons he says we've got? And do you know what we're doing? And they just say, write it down, get it, write it down, write it down, pay the cab, give him a tip. And this is one of the great things that we did keep secrets. We didn't keep secrets. Um, brother, did you have a question? And we're going to pray. I think that the brothers here felt that we would pray at what time? At 4 o'clock. 
we'll, we'll be at four o'clock, okay? Inshallah. Uh, yes, see. Um, I believe it does. You know, the truth will set you free. And, um, you know, mashallah, I gave a presentation like this in the Chicago City Jail. This was at Eid um, back maybe 2003, about 10 years ago. And uh, most of the brothers who came were African Americans. A lot of them were also Hispanics. Uh, some of them were just from the general prison population. And I was concentrating on what I was doing. You know, you try to pay attention to the audience, but one of our brothers, whose name is Jamil, he said, he said, Dr. Armour, he said, I don't know if you noticed it, but he said, I saw lights going on in people's heads. He said, maybe you didn't see that, but he said, I did. So, um, and he said that it really benefited the people there. So we have to know who we are. And uh, I believe that for African Americans, it is very important to be able to go home and to see who are the people that you come from and to meet those people and to learn about those people. And they feel very deeply about that. They feel deeply about that as you also feel deeply about that. And uh, you will see, my wife went there last year. She went to the Gambia. And I had the belief that she was a Mandinka, because I've seen the Mandinkas. And then I also showed her picture. You know, to certain people, they say she's a Mandinka. But my wife, mashallah, this brother knows her really well. Sister Iris knows her really, really well. My wife, Samira, is an extremely solid, sane person. That's why Allah blessed me to have her as a wife, you know, because <laughs> she could hold me like, you fool, you know. She could hold me where I needed to be. She's very, very strong. She's very wise. She's very patient. And so my question was, how will this trip affect her? And I had been in the Gambia weeks before she came. She came a few weeks later. And she told me, she said, on the airplane here. She said, I, said, I saw a man that looks just like my father. I saw a person that looks just like my cousin. I saw people who look like these relatives of mine. And then when she got to the Gambia, she said, I know this place. She said, really? She said, I know, my wife is not like that. You know, Samira, she never talked like that. She doesn't talk like that. And uh, she was like a little girl. And uh, she was like in a dream. And they treated her like a queen. They treated her beautifully, beautifully. And uh, so I think that is very important. I think that's very important. I've had the honor to be among the Gambians now for a long time, many trips, many years. And then after a while, I begin to see the faces. And if I go to Hyde Park, it's just like, you see, these are Wallace, the Serer, this is Mandinka, you know, and Fulani, Fulbeis. If they walked in the mosque the other day, are you expecting to see Fulani? He looks so completely Fulani. And it's hard for me to believe, like, your family's been here for how many hundred years? You know, so I think this is very, very important. Very important. And, you know, a continuity is a big thing. Roots are continuity. And we need to establish those roots, bi'inillahi ta'ala. And, of course, teach Islam the best that we can do. Do the best that we can do, bi'inillahi ta'ala. That's the way I feel. And I really hope and pray that someday we might see all of you over there. You know, come and to see these beautiful lands. Village, visit the village. You'll see your people there. You'll see them. And they will welcome you. They will welcome you. Uh,
many people think that he himself was, in, was a Muslim immigrant from like uh, from South Asia. So I, I but Brother Jew Ali was before then, and I've, I've always mm -hmm. wondered if like there, there was an mm -hmm. early link between mm -hmm. them, or if there was. Um. Uh, you know, in the 1930s, uh, there were studies that were done of African Americans. And uh, one of the really interesting studies was of the Geechee Islands. Mm. And a lot of you know where the Geechee Islands are, right? Off the coast of North Carolina. And, um, you know, they found that a lot of the African Americans that were interviewed there in the Geechee Islands, this is in the 1930s, they had two names. So they would have a Christian name, and they would have another name, which they called basket names. I don't know why they called them basket names. I have an idea. Mm. Maybe because in the Gita Islands, they, they preserved African basket names. Ah. So they want to find like a basket that's just like a West African basket. Wow. That's one of the things. That's about. very interesting. They called them basket names. And that, that's a very, I didn't have any idea about that. But they called them basket names. And these basket names would be overwhelmingly Muslim names. And they would be African pronunciations of Muslim names, like Ahmadu, Amadu, Khadijatu, and things like that. So, um, you know, th those are, th these are things that we have to study. And uh, again, uh, you know, uh, Allah, that history is just there to be discovered. Allah says in the Quran, uh, as for what benefits people, it will remain in the earth. A lot of times it will remain in the earth hidden and buried, like the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls are amazing. They go back before the time of Jesus. They tell things about the religion of Moses that affirms what we believe. And these were put away in caves in the Dead Sea, and they were sealed up with prayers, and they were only discovered after World War II, 1945, 1947. And the whole world, some of you people, if you have as white hair as I have, I don't know if you remember, in the old days we didn't have television. Probably, I don't know if there's anybody here who, who knows that world, but I lived in a world where we didn't have television, even radio wasn't that common. And um, I lived in a little town in western Nebraska, and uh, we would go to the movies on Saturday. And at the beginning of the movie, you have the newsreel, okay? Because you, you're not going to see this stuff anywhere else. And I remember things about the Dead Sea Scrolls. This was big news. And then they discovered another, another cave, another cave, and cave number four, and then blackout. Blackout, after cave number four, they discovered the Bible in cave number four. And then it's like, get everybody that talks out of this group. It will be a few Catholics and a few rabbis. No Protestants were allowed to stay. I don't know why, but that's what they did. They have certain priests, the Catholic Church, and they picked one, by the way. And they have certain rabbis. And for 50 years, no one was allowed, and they, had, they discovered... Um, over a dozen more caves. But they didn't let us see what was there until the 1990s. For your good and my. Uh, one person said that, well, we can't let this information out because it would bring chaos to Jewish and Christian circles. Well, what about our circle? They, well, it wouldn't bring chaos to your circle. You know, so... Um, you know, Allah keeps things in the earth. And uh, one of the things in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it says, because a lot of pious Jews who were heirs of Jacob, at the end of their lives, they would dig and bury what they called a Geniza. A Geniza. You who know Arabic, do you know what Geniza means? In Arabic, you say Geniza. But you wouldn't say, you wouldn't say E, you would use another word. You're not going to say Geniza, you're going to say what? Janaza. Janaza. A Geniza is a burial, and it's just like the story of John the Baptist. That Zachariah, who will inherit what I have of the legacy of Jacob? Because none of these people are trustworthy. I can't give it to them. They will corrupt it. They will change it. So he says to Allah, give me an heir 
who can receive this inheritance, and that was John the Baptist, Yahya. But a lot of them didn't get the heir. They didn't know anyone in their family that could be trusted, so they just bury it, they seal it, they pray upon it, and they ask Allah not to let anyone find it until the end of time. In the book of Maccabees, what happened to the Ark of the Covenant? Well, we don't know for sure what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. The Quran talks about the Ark of the Covenant, the taboot. But in the book of Maccabees, it says that uh, Jeremiah, who knew that Nebuchadnezzar would come and destroy the second, the first temple, he took the Ark of the Covenant and other precious things to a mountain of God. And he put it there in a cave and he sealed the cave how many times so that it would not be opened until the end of time. And the Dead Sea Scrolls are, Allah knows best, one of the signs that the hour is late. <laughs> the hour is late. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls they say, but there are many more like this. There are many more like this. So Allah keeps things in the earth and seek and you will find. Seek and you will find. And I believe that our history is there, but our history is hidden, protected. And inshallah, may Allah give us the keys to bring it out. And one of the things I love to research, um, it's one of the things I was trained to do. And one of the things about research is that, you know, you have to be really careful. You have to be really careful what you're doing because often you find something that you don't think is significant. You better pay attention. For example, the First Nations of this land, I don't like to call them Native Americans. They're First Nations. They were the First Nations, the Iroquois, the Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Creek, and the others. These First Nations. But the First Nations had dogs. That's the only domestic animal they had. Do you know anything about a Cherokee dog? Have you ever seen a Cherokee dog? A real Cherokee dog, because I have. They don't bark. Native Americans had what are called barkless dogs. Well, what in the world is the importance of that? Let me take you to West Africa. Because in West Africa, the Mandinka dog, which is a very intelligent dog, and is used to protect the children, I've seen it. The Mandinka dog is a barkless dog. Does that mean that it can't bark? No, I, I know a little bit about dogs. You know, dogs speak language, and my father and my grandfather, they taught me how to read that language, otherwise you're gonna get bit. You better know what it means when he puts his ears up and what it means when he puts his ears down. Okay, so it's like, I know I can do certain things to this dog. I, I was once in a field, beautiful field, uh, in the center of Gambia. And uh, they're beautiful children, beautiful children. And they had a little Mandinka dog. What's, he, he's not little, he's about this big, like a coyote. And uh, what's he doing there? Protecting the children, of course. Because there might be a snake, there might be a scorpion, there might be a baboon, there are other things. So he is guarding the children. And he doesn't make a sound. And I know they're barkless dogs. I've been told that. Then I come up to see the children. They want to see me. Oh, wow. It's like, you better be careful. This dog's ready to attack. Because mm. that's what he's doing. He's watching me. If I, I know if I do the wrong move, he's going to be on me. Because he has got to protect the children. Mm. But then uh, in another situation, I may fast move at him like that. He went, wah, wah, wah. So, oh, okay, you can bark. <laughs> I, I thought you could bark. But the thing is, he's trained not to bark. You see, he's been bred not to bark. Why? Because in West Africa, you need a barkless dog. Because most of West Africa, especially the land of the kingdom of Mali, it does have big forests. It does have jungles. But also most of it's savanna. It's open land, sort of dry land. And at nighttime, there are elephants, there are lions, there are leopards, there are also marauding tribes. You don't want the dog barking like a fool all night because it will give away your village. The Native Americans, the First Nations, they don't need barkless dogs. They live in forests. They could use a dog that barks so they can find, where is the village? I need to get home. I'm lost in the forest. So these are really interesting things. And, you know, that's why we have to study really carefully. And inshallah, may Allah give us the keys to discover the treasures of the past, the treasures which is in you, the treasure that is in you. The world is old, but the future springs from the past. 
Uh, let's start now and inshallah we make salah. وَنُوَفِّقْنَا لِمَا تُحِبُّهُ وَتَرْضَى وَجَعَلْنَا نَعَبِيدِكَ سُعَدَى وَأَمِّتْنَا عَلَى كَلْمَةِ الْهُدَى عَلِّمْنَا مَا يَنْفَعُنَا وَوَفِّقْنَا لِلْعَمَلِ بِمَا عَلَّمْتَنَا بِهِ وَاجْعَلْ مَا نَحْنُ فِيهِ خَالِصًا مُخْلِصًا لِوَجْهِكَ الْكَرِيمِ رَبِّ الْعَامِينَ اللهم اجعل تجمعنا هذا تجمع مرحوما وتفرقنا بعده تفرقا معصوما لا شقيا ولا محروما أمين 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 يا رب العالمين